So often they are standing completely still, yet when I look up again a few minutes later, they are in another place, again standing completely still. As everybody knows, one never sees the sun in one's dreams. When I was a pretentious girl of 16, with a prancing intellect and an overweening desire for romance, I sailed to Europe on the student ship Aurelia. To cross an ocean is, of course, a form of transition, a crossing, in this case from Wooddale Road, locus of all things American and childish, to Europe, birthplace of the most interesting forms of sin, <laughs> blazing blue, blazing white, sky and sea and smokestack. That's what I recollect about the voyage, as well as having to sleep in a cabin crammed with four bunk beds and eight hormonally charged young women on a ship teeming with potential romantic partners of every stripe everywhere you looked. Here's what I didn't want. Someone my own age who thought beer drinking games were fun. <laughs> These would be boys. Here's what I wanted, someone older, preferably someone who would ferry me away to Alexandria, <laughs> wine press of love. I affected a paisley scarf, peasant style, huge dark glasses, a Russian accent, a limited <laughs> understanding of English. I said my name was Lubimia, <laughs> one of the few Russian words I knew, meaning love. <laughs> In addition to high school students headed to Europe for the summer and college students headed to Europe for a semester, there were college teachers on the ship getting paid to run workshops. There was a bald man teaching a drawing class who found me exotic. And when he asked me to pose for his class, I feigned misunderstanding. Here's what I didn't want, an old bald man who had fallen for my disguise. <clears throat> At some point, I entered the ship theater where Woman in the Dunes was playing. I slid into a back row seat late I had no idea what was happening on the screen. Naked bodies and piles of sand and a woman speaking a foreign language. I was on a boat to Europe that contained a movie theater. I had never seen anything like this in my life. On my right, a handsome college student, outlier of his group, headed to Denmark for his junior year abroad. I dropped the Russian accent but retained the dark glasses, which were prescription, and hid the fact that I needed regular glasses. The student was a philosophy major at Oberlin, a copy of either or, prominent on his lap. And for a time, I became obsessed with Kierkegaard. <laughs> My usual mistake, confusing scholarship and romance. <laughs> Though I have to admit, I learned a lot this way. Romantic obsession taken to the point of madness is the subject, maybe more specifically the landscape, of Gerard de Nerval's novella Aurelia, written not long after the author was released from the sanatorium in Passy. My romantic obsession with the handsome college student didn't take me to the point of madness, but merely across the Atlantic Ocean, Whereas Nerval's love for Jenny Colon, the fetching blonde cantatrice from Bologna, who is said to have been the real Aurelia, remained unrequited. It took him all the way to that final transition from this world to the next. I was in a deserted place, a steep rocky slope in the middle of the woods, a single house which I thought I recognized overlooked this desolate landscape. I kept losing my way in the maze. Tired of fighting through the rocks and brambles, now and then I would seek an easier path along the wooded trails. They're waiting for me over there, I thought to myself. Aurelia, Aurelia. 
There's a kind of transit that occurs between the place in your mind where memory resides, as firmly planted as the house you grew up in, and the operative tool of thought designed to transport you and your memory elsewhere, as if across the ocean on a boat. <coughs> the ship kept appearing at first on the horizon, an abstraction like the Kahana, but then close up, particular, a vision of the particular self at a particular moment, requisite to memory's need for a host to carry it as far away from memory lane as possible. The excitement of having been, of being that girl in the paisley scarf, waiting with almost impossible avidity for something, anything to happen, broke the wall between memory and thought. The psyche went into spasms of anticipation. A mysterious transaction was about to take place. Something wrote was about to become something alive. This is how the associative moment occurs. The Aurelia I traveled to Europe on flew an American flag, but like my long ago self, had assumed a variety of nationalities and names. <laughs> Originally christened the Huascaron for a Peruvian mountain, she had been built in Hamburg in 1938 as a repair vessel for Nazi worships, her original inspection conducted by Hermann Goering. Aurelia is the Latin translation of the Greek word for chrysalis, the gold-colored pupa of the butterfly, emblem of metamorphosis and hiddenness. In 1947, the Huraskan became the Bavergray, a post-war immigrant liner. By 1951, she had made 52 trips and transported 33,255 displaced persons from Germany to Canada. In 1955, she was sold to an Italian line and was totally overhauled, provided with air conditioning and a Lido pool. She made her maiden voyage as the Aurelia in 1955, but it wasn't until the summer of 1960 that the U.S. Council on Student Travel chartered her and filled her with young people. Eventually, she became the Romanza, a standard cruise ship, and at last the Romantica, catching fire and burning out of control 60 miles off the Cypriot city of Limassol on October 4th, 1997, before getting towed to Alexandria to be broken up into parts. To Alexandria, winepress of love, graveyard of ships. As if long prepared for this, as if courageous, Bid her farewell, the Alexandria that is leaving, wrote Kavafi. Above all, do not be fooled. Do not tell yourself it was only a dream. Dream is a second life, the narrator of Aurelia tells us. I have never been able to cross through those gates of ivory or horn which separate us from the invisible world without a sense of dread. In the last month of my husband's life, he became preoccupied with the gold ring he had been wearing until it no longer fit over his swollen knuckle. The ring had belonged to my Uncle Fred and came to me upon my uncle's death. At some point, my husband decided he liked it and wanted to wear it. The ring is heavy with a rectangular face in which the initials FD for Fred Davis appear, the D larger than the F due to a triangular space above the F where a diamond has been set. I never thought the ring was especially attractive. It isn't, but my husband wore it as religiously as his wedding ring. <coughs> he was specific about not wanting to see it cremated along with his mortal remains and the Rex Stout novel he hadn't quite finished reading. <laughs> During the final month of his life, my husband had a lot to say about the ring. 
There should be a storm drain in the room, he told me and our daughter. The water, which was the essence of the three of us, was going to be rising, our emotions lapping at our ankles, up to our knees and thighs. He wanted us to know that while there was no way to stop the water from rising, as long as he was wearing the ring, it would act as a drain. My husband wasn't hallucinating. He was coherent and conversational. He provided this information as breezily as you might remind someone that tomorrow night they should cover the basil plants. He also pointed out that the ring had a hairline crack in it at the base of the shank. If he was going to be able to wear it, it needed to be repaired and resized. But he also said, suppose the ring is the drain of my bardo, then fixing it stoppers up the drain. Do I want that to happen sooner or later? Chance does strange things, the narrator of Aurelia tells us. He has only recently learned of his beloved's death. He remembers a ring he gave her, an antique ring set with an opal carved in the shape of a heart. And because the ring was too large for her finger, he decided to have it cut down in size only realizing his mistake when he heard the sound of a saw and could see blood flowing. In the dreamscape of Aurelia, most material objects end by seeming, like Aurelia herself, evanescent, elusive. But the ring, because it isn't a dream ring, acquires heft, as does a second ring, silver, slipped off the narrator's finger in Notre Dame de Lorette while he piously kneels at the altar of the Virgin, and a third ring he wears shortly thereafter to the osteological exhibits at the Museum of Natural History. When received or bestowed as gifts, rings have a negative association for Nerval, the opposite when perceived as Ordalia, as in the case of the third ring, likewise silver. Eventually, the narrator leaves the museum and goes out into the garden where it's pouring rain. What a shame, he thinks. All the women and children are going to get drenched. Then he realizes things are far more serious. This is the beginning of the real flood, he thinks. The water was rising in the nearby streets. I ran down the Rue Saint Victor, and believing I might be able to stem the global tide, I threw the ring I had bought at Saint Eustache into the deepest part of the water. It was roughly at this moment that the rain tapered off and a ray of sun burst forth. On the Aurelia, I spent a lot of time standing alone at the rail, smoking. I thought this was a good look for me. The swells of the North Atlantic surging dark and impenetrable in all directions. The ship's forward movement made it impossible to comprehend the nature of the tidal motion going on below, like the vessels or veins that wind through the lobes of the brain, as Nerval describes it. Streams made up of living beings in a molecular state, which only the speed at which I was traveling made it impossible to distinguish. The ship was so small, the size of a flea, the size of an atom of a flea, by comparison with the enormous ball that was the Earth, never mind the entire universe. That's all you get, my husband cautioned on his deathbed. The ripple is what we live on, and we get to pull up one ripple of the water the way cars create a vacuum as they race around a track like clamshells. That's all you get, a ripple, a little bitty thing, a wave, because the world is so huge. You just get to use it for a little while. When I was a 16-year-old girl riding the Aurelia to Europe, my husband was a nine-year-old boy with 57 years left in which to do all the things he ended up doing in his life. The course of the transit is impossible to fathom, except via the remarkable apparatus of association. Even the North Atlantic has its limits. 
from Pier 21 in New York City to the great court of La Havre. Whatever I was pretending to be that week on the ship is exactly what I was, the implausible outward trappings of the infinitely smaller thing inside that was and still is making the journey 